faith is is absolutely essential. I mean, you know, we everyone would agree to that. But there's a lot of confusion out there about what exact what is faith. And uh, so, when the Bible talks about faith, what exactly is it referring to? Well, first of all, it says the just shall live by faith. By grace are you saved through faith. Mm -hmm. So, if we don't know what faith is, uh, we've got some very serious problems. Uh, faith in the Bible in contrast to everything else out there in the world, is in God. Have faith in God. Faith is absolute, total, unquestioning trust and obedience. There's the obedience of faith. And no one or nothing but God deserves that. Mm -hmm. So the heart of it, it really is a relationship. It is a relationship with God. And mm -hmm. you can't trust God unless you know God. So Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, right. and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And then, when we have that relationship with God, he begins to guide us, to teach us through his word, by his Holy Spirit. And that then becomes what the Bible calls the faith, the Some, whole counsel. Mm -hmm. Something that has moral content. Not moral just content a, and an demands idea obedience. It's not just a power that right. we tune into and manipulate God or manipulate his universe. Um, it has moral content. It demands obedience. So Acts 6, verse 6, for example, a great company of the priests was obedient to the faith. Romans 1 talks about the obedience of faith among all nations. Obedience to the faith among all nations in Romans 16. Uh, so, uh, the, the scripture warns us also <clears throat> that in the last days, for example, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some will depart, not depart from believing God for great and mighty miracles, uh, which is a popular idea today, that miracles, <clears throat> signs and wonders will solve everything, but it says some will depart from the faith. Right. And also in Luke 18, it says, When the Son of Man cometh, will he find the faith of the Lord? faith, right. In Second right. Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, examine yourselves, whether right. you be in the faith. It's very important. So we better know what faith is right. and not be deceived. No wonder Satan would try to deceive people as to what faith is, because faith is absolutely essential. By grace are you saved right. through faith. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Right. And in the confusion, if you think that you're doing something, you're creating something, you're building something, in effect, you could be drawn away from that trust and personal relationship with the Lord. Absolutely. Is the term trust similar to faith? Give some scriptures that indicate a relationship between the two terms. You may now stop the tape for further discussion. You know, there's a great deal of talk today in the world about faith. And uh, certainly there's confusion there. But the kind of faith that they're talking about, we find it in business and medicine and science. Is that the same kind of faith that the Bible talks about? Not as far as I can discern, uh, Tom, because first of all, these people are not Christians, the ones that are promoting this. Unfortunately, people who call themselves Christians and who are active within the church and in leaders and writers and so forth, they pick up some of the same concepts and they mix it in mm -hmm. uh, with the, with biblical right. well, terminology. What, what do they have in mind then in this faith? Well, faith becomes a state of mind, for example. Positive thinking. Mm -hmm. Rather than being negative, let's be positive, and that gets confused with faith. It becomes a form of believism, which is very much like emotionalism. Mm -hmm. You got a very exciting football game, and you're, everybody's cheering, and you know, mm -hmm. back and forth, and so you decide, well, let's come back tomorrow night, and we'll do it again. But there's no teams on the field, but you got the cheerleaders, and everybody's excited. That's emotionalism. It's right? like enthusiasm is a power. Right. right. Not just... Believism is mm -hmm. talking yourself into believing something, right. but there's no objective basis for it. Uh, then it becomes kind of a mind power, because Jesus said, your faith has saved you, your faith has healed you, well, faith is believing, so I, I guess I was healed because I believed I would be healed. Mm -hmm. Well, if then I can have anything that I believe I can have. If I believe I've got a Cadillac, I, I, I'll have a Cadillac, and faith is believing that I'm going to get what I'm praying for, but that's mind power. 
has nothing to do with God, and I can create reality with my mind. This is another delusion, and there are all kinds of people out there who are trying to promote this. Yeah, give me some, of some examples. For example, in medicine, we, we hear this a lot. Well, um, now there is some biblical basis for that. Solomon wrote, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Right. So uh, people like Dr. McMillan have written books, for example, none of these diseases showing that if you're happy and optimistic, uh, your glands and nerves will work better and so forth. There's a measure of truth in that, but that has nothing to do with faith in God, which brings miracles, which changes my life. Um, but uh, it becomes um, sort of what well, they call it the placebo effect, for mm -hmm. example. You've got people like Herbert Benson, Dr. Benson of Harvard University, who has written a book about this, equating the placebo effect, the placebo being a pill that has no power in itself, but if you think it's something that it isn't, it will produce that effect because you think that it will. They don't know why this works. Well, <clears throat> when you equate that with faith, in God, then God becomes just a cosmic placebo. All right, so it's not just semantics. I mean, in one way, they're discussing something that really has to do with power, a technique, and so on. The other way, related to God... Um, it, it divorces it completely right. from God now. It's a placebo. God is merely a placebo. You can have faith in God, you can have faith in Buddha, you can have faith in Jesus, doesn't matter what you call, call it, just so it triggers this effect in the mind, right. and the mind does everything now, and it's too, somehow there's a cosmic force out there, right. there are forces at work, yeah. and, and our minds trigger them. So it affects healing, but also in the business community. And, uh, well, you'd be very successful with these techniques. Uh, you've got people, for example, psychology, psychologists, of course, are, are the main ones. They're, they're trying to find a scientific method that makes us tick, what makes us successful, and so forth. One of the best known is Dennis Waitley. Now, he is a Christian, I presume, at least he's been on Christian shows and claims to be a Christian. Uh, his book, Ten Seeds of Greatness, The Ten Best Kept Secrets of Total Success, where after success, uh, seed number seven is called the seed of faith. But you read the whole chapter and it says nothing about God. He's got ten action steps to optimism on page 160. Right. Supposed to be faith, but optimism is not faith. He says, fly with the eagles, don't run around the henny pennies. We're looking up, chanting, the sky is falling. Optimism and realism go together. Uh, listen to upbeat, inspiring music. Change your vocabulary. Get high on yourself. Uh, instead of saying, I'm worn out, say I'm relaxed after an active day. And, so forth. So these all come back to self. It has nothing to do with a personal relationship with God, a trust in Him, and that's where the confusion lies, doesn't it? And these are states of mind. But listen, mm -hmm. six questions about your faith. Do you expect success? What do you say to yourself? In other words, are you hyping yourself up? Mm -hmm. um, are you lucky? Why or why not? Uh, do you get high or low on your thoughts? Uh, would you? Would others view you as an optimist? Uh, Tom, I mean, these are fine ideas for people who want to achieve business success, uh, but it should not be called faith. It has nothing to do. Uh, if it is faith, then when Jesus said, have faith in God, it's no better than having faith in something else, because it's faith that does it. It's not God who does it, and that means that I am in control and I'm not dependent upon him, and it has nothing to do with his will being affected in my life. You may now stop the tape to give some other examples of believism that you've recognized in secular society, and what is wrong with believism. You know, we've talked about faith in the, as the world sees it, and one of the problems that I think we've found is that uh, this has created confusion, and these ideas have uh, begun to creep into the church. Some in a, in a very heavy way. But what do you think has moved us away from uh, the basic doctrines of faith? Um, well, uh, faith is not sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, and uh, people don't like that. Yeah, uh, we tend to say uh, something like this, well, God, if you can't explain it to my peanut brain, I'm not going to believe it. You know, We don't realize that faith is absolutely essential because there are things that we can't grasp totally in our, with our minds, and we're going to have to trust God for these things. But 
You don't want to do that. You don't want to walk in the dark and, and let him hold your hand and lead you and guide you. Mm -hmm. We want to direct our own steps. That's part of the problem. Uh, I think also, uh, sincere people within the church are trying to stir up faith. They see a lot of unbelief and maybe they're trying to get miracles. Uh, and uh, they're trying to move the mountain, for example. You know, when Jesus said, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be thy removed. And, wow, that sounds fantastic. And they command mountains to move and they don't move. So, well, we got to come up with some technique for getting this thing called faith. But if faith is in God, then I will never speak to a mountain to move unless I know that it is God's will to move it and I know when and where God wants to move it through me as his instrument. Faith is not something that I grab a hold of, and then I go around and begin to speak to mountains, causing them to move. No, uh, that's believism, right? That's sorcery, really. <clears throat> uh, Tom, we, we got an interesting letter recently in response to the book. Mm -hmm. And this woman says, uh, in reading this book, it was as if someone was gripping me and shaking me out of a deep sleep. I awakened to a world of slumbering Christians of which I was a member. No wonder my prayers go unanswered. I was trying to make that mountain move through my faith instead of building faith in God who moves mountains. Right. You know, and, and I think we've seen so many times where people try to develop faith or try to develop a believism. It's, it's too crushing. I mean, it's... it's uh, Faith, in some cases, that way, has des destroyed the faith of some people. Tom, I've talked to many people, and we've gotten letters from, from some of them. And they come under condemnation. They belong to a church that professes that no one ever gets sick. It's never God's will that anyone should ever get sick. Well, anyone who ever taught that is either dead or on their way to, to die, on their way to the grave, or they're going to be raptured out of here. Because no one from the days of the Apostle Paul until now has ever been able to live that. But they come under a burden of guilt. Mm -hmm. And something's wrong with them. People come and pray for them. They're not healed. And what do they say? It's your faith. You don't have enough faith. You don't have enough faith. And uh, Or they claim that Cadillac or whatever. And pretty soon they just throw out the whole thing. Well, you know, it, it seems to me that... Uh this doesn't just come out of the world, but we've also seen this idea uh, in some of the cults, particularly uh, the mind science cults. Right. right. Um, the idea that uh, it's all out there, we're all a part of it, we're all divine, prosperity is our divine right. Um, well, it was, as we explain in the book, <clears throat> very briefly, it was called New Thought. Yeah way back there, and it basically it is a mind power, it's a technique for manipulating God. Unfortunately, it's come into the church, and there are teachers who try to um, bend the scriptures in order to justify this idea. For example, one of the most popular teachers out there uh, in the faith movement, so-called, takes Hebrews 11, where it says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, turns it around to say, we understand that it was by faith that God framed the worlds. Therefore, faith is a power that God used. Faith <clears throat> is there, is also a power where, since we're in God's class, we, God's creative power will work for us. We can do what God does. And uh, God released his faith in words. Of course, God doesn't have faith. In whom would he trust? Right. We trust in him. But God released his power in words. We can release this thing called faith by speaking the right words, you see. It's uh, it's a perversion of scripture, but it's uh, well-meaning. Um, they, in Mark 11, verse 22, where Jesus said, have faith in God, they turn around and say, have the God kind of faith. Have the same kind of faith that God has. But that's hardly biblical. No, and it takes a God, to, if God <clears throat> did have faith, it would take a God to have the God kind of faith. Right. That's another problem. Right. All right. Let me go over some points here. So, belief, faith is believism has really become a power directed at God rather than right. a trust in Him, as we right. said before. Mm -hmm. Something based on your personal relationship with Him, which takes the burden off of you and moves you into submission to a God who's all-powerful, 
has all wisdom, who knows what's best for us in each and every circumstance. And faith is a power aimed at God to make him do what we want him to do. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, Tom, a form of naturalism, actually. Right. <clears throat> because God then is tied in through uh, the laws of cause and effect. It's the old magician's bargain of the occultists that Dr. Faust made with Mephistopheles, the little devil. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's exactly what Mary Baker Eddy did. She turned Jesus into a scientist, and everything works by scientific laws, and all you have to do is scientifically apply them, and boom, now if God is tied in by a cause and effect relationship, then it's no longer a matter of his will, mm -hmm. but we can make him do what we want to do. It's, it's an attempt somehow to get control of this, mm -hmm. of this situation so that we can explain it scientifically and it will be rational and reasonable and you follow A leads to B leads to C and you crank this formula through the machine you get a predictable result mm -hmm. out the other end and that's not the way right. God... God <clears throat> on the one hand it looks like a way to expedite this and an easy way to go but on the other hand the burden really falls upon our shoulders doesn't it? It's self-oriented, right. 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 It's all depends upon me, my getting the faith, and also Tom, this idea that you need to have more faith. Mm -hmm. um, that's not true. Jesus said you only need a grain of mustard seed's worth of faith. Why did he say that? Not because, as some people would say, because it grows and grows and grows. You don't need a lot of faith. Your faith must be in God, because it's God who does it, not your faith that does it. And you just need a little tiny bit of faith in God. You may now stop the tape and discuss the questions. In what other ways does believism corrupt the biblical concepts of faith? And what is wrong with the idea that man's faith causes God to act on man's behalf? Well, you know, in the, in the time that's left, one of the uh, things that I want to deal with are really going to the scriptures, really searching out the scriptures. I don't want, you know, the heart of the book uh, that we wrote really was to encourage people back to the Word of God, like the Bereans, to test everything according to the Word. Mm -hmm. So let's test some ideas related to faith. You know, I wouldn't want it thought that we were against faith. I mean, that's, that's, that's absurd. We are for biblical faith. Faith. Amen. Right. Amen. And we will contend earnestly for, for the, the faith. faith. Right. Um, Matthew nine twenty two. When he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well, and the woman was made whole from that hour. Now, isn't that believism? The term of faith is in God, <clears throat> and faith requires an object. Mm -hmm. It requires an object because it's not faith that does it, but God who does it, and only God can heal. Her faith was in Jesus. She said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. So her faith was in him, and he said virtue went out of him okay and she was healed so it wasn't her believing that did it although well then what part does faith play well it opens us our hearts to god we trust him we're willing to obey him we're willing to let him direct our lives uh, so certainly faith is absolutely essential in Acts uh, 3.16 it says, And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So again, if this is just one placebo that triggers this mind power, then what's the point? See, there's no point of having sound doctrine and being sound in the faith. Mm -hmm. And he makes it very clear. It is faith that comes through him. It is faith in his name. And, of course, 1 John 5, verse 13, God has given eternal life. Uh, and this life is in his Son. In verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So... Faith has a definite object, it is God, and the faith means there is something specific that we must believe. Uh, first, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto everyone who believes it. And you are not going to get salvation 
by just triggering some uh, positive or optimistic uh, uh, thoughts mm -hmm. uh, by some placebo. Okay, let me pick up on that. Uh, some of the scriptures, when they deal talking about faith, they're talking about some negative things. I mean, I'm reading here, Paul writing, we are hard-pressed, this is 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8, we are hard-pressed on every side, uh, side, yet not crushed, we are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Always mm -hmm. burning about in the body the, the death of the Lord Jesus, right. that we may be quickened through him. Well, um, I think part of the confusion again is, uh, as we have in 1 Timothy 6, verse 12, people are not willing to fight the good fight of faith. <laughs> it's a battle. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean it's a battle to believe in God. Let's hasten to say that. Right. Faith comes through a relationship with God. And when you know him, you trust him. You believe in him. You know he loves you. You know his way is best. You know he has all power. And you trust yourself in his hands. Well, what's this battle, this fight of faith? It's the shield of faith that we have to hold up against all the fiery darts of the, of the wicked. Because things don't just automatically work out the way we think they will as soon as we trigger this thing called faith, you know. There are enemies out there. There's a battle to be fought. And I think that battle is going to become increasingly tough in, in the days ahead. Let me go to some other scriptures. Uh, Hebrews 11, um, verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But then Hebrews goes on to talk about other aspects of faith. That uh, mm -hmm. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place that he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out that chapter is all about obedience uh, by faith moses when he was come to years refused his faith in god which brought a, has moral content the faith which brought about a relationship of obedience and trust i love that hymn trust and obey there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Because of this, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer prosperity with the people. Oh, sorry, I got the wrong translation. Right. Right. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. He went after the reproach of Christ rather than the treasures of this world. But today, we're being taught to go after the success, really, of the world. And you can take the same success methods that are out there in the business world, and you bring them right into the church, and you put uh, biblical terminology around them, and, uh, and now we begin to live our Christian lives this way. And I think well, that's what we're seeing, aren't we? Right. Right. Well, you know, but when, let me, Tom, yeah. let me just finish, because that chapter ends like this. It says, women receive their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. It says, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. They were persecuted, afflicted, tormented. They dwelt in dens and caves of the earth of whom this world was not worthy, and these all died in faith. Now, that's a little bit different idea than you get of faith uh, in much of the popular thinking today. It brought persecution, it brought suffering and affliction, but there was a triumph because they remained true to the Lord. Mm -hmm. they, they, they contended earnestly for the faith, and they walked in obedience to him no matter what happened to them. You know, one of the things that concerns me related to faith, the idea of claiming something, is mm -hmm. that it takes away the idea of humility. It takes away the idea of supplication. And it puts yeah, us... Yeah, right. If you can just demand it of God, if it's our divine right, then I'm really not dependent upon Him anymore. Mm -hmm. I certainly am not in a position of humility. I'm not in a position of coming to Him and depending... I mean, there's no grace... Right. This kind of faith is not associated with grace. It's associated with the ability to think certain thoughts, and it's very much like works, as you, al as you already said. The other side of that is that 
faith has to do with living the godly life. Amen. And it draws, it seems to me, that you're drawn away from righteousness, from your heart being right before God, and it puts you mm -hmm. um, not just in control, but it draws you away from that intimate, personal relationship and concern about fear of God. I mean, it There's exhausts very us, little, doesn't it? very little fear of God in the land today. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no fear of moving to his throne to demand our divine right. That's, yeah. that's sure. Well, you see, uh, Tom, faith, and, and look, um, we're not sitting here trying to criticize no. people. Uh, who knows how many blind spots we have that we don't know about, but the Lord has shown us some things that are going on out there from his word, and we would urge... You know, that's right. part of the whole purpose of the book and of this study guide is to get people back to the Word of God. But part of this confusion that comes in the area of faith is people want to get answers to prayer. And they think that faith is some kind of a thing that you get a handle on. And if, and, and if you can think this way and believe it will happen, it gets an answer to your prayer. Now, they're forgetting a lot of it. There are conditions to answering, getting answers to our prayer. I think you've, you've got well, some let's go to First John 3, right. verses 21 and 22. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. What about First John 5, 14 and 15? If we ask anything according to His will, mm -hmm. we know that He hears us. And if we know that he hear us, then we know that we have the petitions that we ask. So it has to be according to his will. It has to be because we're living a life that's pleasing him. And there are many uh, hindrances to prayer. I mean, you can try to get faith all you want to. For example, um, Joshua. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. In, I think it's chapter 6. Um, chapter 7, verse chap six, chapter six seven, through Verses 6 through 12. Mm -hmm. Joshua, the the armies of Israel were defeated at Ai, and Joshua falls on his face, and he cries out to God. And, and God doesn't say, Joshua, you just have to believe. Mm -hmm. uh, believe a little more. I mean, if you, you either believe or you don't believe, so you don't have more faith. Uh, he doesn't say, stand up and claim those promises. I said that every part of this, that the sole of your foot treads on, is yours. Claim your promises. Claim your divine right. You know, uh, what did he say? He said, get up. This is no time to pray. You can have all of the faith. I mean, this believism right, type believism, of faith. Right. And that is not going to help you. There is sin in the camp, and sin must be repented of, and the relationship restored before I can bless you. That alone would tell you that that, that blessing from God and answers to prayer is not some automatic thing right. that we trigger by the way we think. So faith becomes a technique. Uh, well, how does that... Stand in the light of Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, and it cannot, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. And Jesus said, you know, in the so-called Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, in Matthew 6, for example. And then he said, if you do not forgive them, your Father will not forgive right. you. Well, we certainly don't get our prayers answered, and that relationship is destroyed. And then in Mark 11, uh, Jesus said, when you stand praying, if you've got anything against anybody, you better forgive him. Well, your prayers are not going to be answered. So there are a lot of conditions right. that would tell us that it's just not some uh, some positive thought that automatically triggers a divine response. Right. And again, it comes back to the personal relationship. Your walk with the Lord, your submission to Him, right. and your trust in Him. I mean, what more could you ask for? The, the Creator Amen. of man. Amen. Um, all right, let me close with this. True faith grows out of a relationship, as we've said, with God, and God, we become channels of God's love, mm -hmm. and so on. And to try and turn him into a placebo, into a power, into a, uh, a genie in a bottle, to right. affect what we want. I mean, only God can be God. Mm -hmm. And that's really the problem, isn't it? As Paul wrote to Timothy, 
hold fast the pattern of sound words. That is, I think he's talking about being obedient to sound doctrine, which you have heard from me in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's faith. The scriptures talk about God, the one true God, mm -hmm. and they talk about the gods. Mm -hmm. um, what do they mean? I mean, first of all, the one true God, as opposed to the gods. Well, <clears throat> there's no doubt about it that there is only one true God. And you can't have many gods um, that are true gods. And of course, logic would tell you that, but the Bible makes it very clear. Jesus in John 17, um, three. 17 verse 3 said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who thou hast sent. Therefore, any other gods are false gods. And the Bible does talk about other gods, of course. In Isaiah 43, <clears throat> God says, I am God. There is none else beside me. There is none other. There was no God formed before me. Neither shall there be any God formed after me. I am God, and there is none else. That's about as clear as you can get. So whenever the Bible talks about gods, then they must be, even though in the, in the Hebrew they don't have capitals, nevertheless, the translators put in a little g, because any other God except the true God is a false God. Mm -hmm. In Jeremiah 9, 23, it says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. So the mm -hmm. idea of knowing the true God is absolutely critical. Uh -huh. It's life eternal. <clears throat> if you don't know the only true God, and of course we were speaking earlier about faith, if you don't know him, how can you possibly trust him? How can you possibly have confidence in him and believe in him? But here's another scripture. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> For though there be that are called gods, well, let me go back to verse... Uh, <clears throat> let me go back to verse 4. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, that is, there, there are many that are called this, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Of course, again, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, For there is one God, mm -hmm. and one mediator between God and man, man, the man Christ Jesus. So you get this idea over and over from Scripture. I mean, I've got Scriptures here, Jeremiah 10.10, 10, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. Isaiah 44, uh, 6, 8, Isaiah 45, 1 Kings 8.60, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. But then, in Psalm 95.3, it says, the Lord is the great God and the great King above the gods. Mm -hmm. I know you made reference to that, but... He's, he's, called, the most, he's called the most high right. God. And Satan had the impossible dream. He said, I will be like the Most High. Mm -hmm. Well, how many Most Highs can you have? You can only have one. Uh, obviously, in Psalm 96, verse 5, it says, The gods of the people, that is, the nations around us, are idols. But the Lord, Jehovah, made the heavens. He's the Creator. And mm -hmm. you know that uh, Isaiah ridicules them. <coughs> it says, they cut down a tree and they... Use part of the log to build a fire, part of it to pick their teeth, part of it to warm themselves, and part of it they make a god. And they have to carry it around 
They have eyes, but they can't see, mouths they can't speak, and the people who make them are like unto them. There is only one true God. Mm -hmm. Have you been exposed to the ideas that would equate man with either being God, being a God, or becoming a God? You may now stop the tape and discuss the context in which that has occurred. Dave, in, in Psalm 95, 3, it says, The Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. Mm -hmm. Who are these other gods, all gods? Well, the other gods are, first of all, false gods. <clears throat> That's a given, uh, as we've already discussed. Uh, false gods were, first of all, the demons. We already quoted that an idol is nothing but the things that the Gentiles sacrifice to idols, they sacrifice to devils. So the gods are really demons, devils, the followers of Satan, and they are called this because they're trying to be gods. Mm -hmm. uh, and Satan is the one who said, I will be like the Most High, so he aspired to this, and some of the angels apparently followed him. Mm -hmm. So they are the false gods. He's called the god of this world, so he would be really the most high god over these false gods. Mm -hmm. would, he, would that be, he's been given authority? Um, well, he has power, right. and I believe that in the spirit world, um, the spirit world is a, is a different dimension, obviously. Mm -hmm. There are different laws that govern it. Uh, those laws are not subject to the laws of chemistry and physics and, mm -hmm. and thermodynamics and so forth. So if that dimension intrudes into this dimension, it would seem supernatural to us, although it is still under the, uh, the authority of God. So what I think is uh, the situation from Scripture, God allows Satan to have authority or power over human beings um, to the extent that we open our hearts to him, or in very special cases, um, as in the case of Job, uh, to test the faith of Job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so these gods, false gods, are the gods of the heathen. They don't know the true God, mm -hmm. so they look to behind the idols to demonic beings who seem to have supernatural power and who are engaged in a game of deception uh, and destruction and who are only too happy to have other beings join in their rebellion against God. And apparently, Tom, the prize is the soul of man because God has committed himself to the redemption of mankind. And if mm -hmm. Satan could ever prove that man can get along without the true God, mm -hmm. then Satan would have won the day. Right. But this idea of gods, the gods, it's, these are still a label of rebellion. Oh, um, yes, because there's only one true God. Right. But I want to read in Joshua 2.11, it says, For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and earth below. Right. So this idea of God is a very derogatory kind of... Uh, term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In Acts 17.24 it says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. Right. So these are still pretenders after God's throne. But Satan is called the God of this world right. because he has taken that position in the minds of men and they have given their allegiance to him. Mm -hmm. uh, well then, the next step is that we imagine that we too our gods, and that, of course, was what Satan offered Eve. Right. Now, <clears throat> we consider the world to be secular, to be not, not to be religious, but this idea of being a god <clears throat> is really coming to the forefront, isn't it? Yeah, as we already mentioned, they have a different idea for that, of course. It's some kind of a union archetype, or it's a projection from your unconscious, it's a state of consciousness, but this idea is at the heart of all of the cults, mm -hmm. and uh, I have just a few <coughs> examples here. <clears throat> For example, in Transcendental Meditation, I'm quoting from Meditations of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, page 178, he says, he perverts scripture where God says uh, to his people, be still and know that I am God, 
And he turns around and says, Be still and know that you are God. And when you know that you are God, you will begin to live Godhood. Unity School of Christianity says, I'm quoting from Charles and and Merle Fillmore, teach us to pray on page 13. Thus, we must understand the nature of the God to whom we pray and awaken in ourselves that divine nature. <clears throat> it's the same eye. I will be like the Most High. Sun Myung Moon, uh, in Christianity and Crisis on page 5, says, God and man are one. Mm -hmm. Man is incarnate God. Uh, Est, Erhard Seminars Training, which has now become the forum, uh, Werner Erhardt said, Your God in your universe, you caused it. In other words, you created everything. If you were born with a birth defect, that's your fault. You made yourself that way. Benjamin Krim um, says, Man is, this is a, a transmission from Lord Maitreya, supposedly, mm -hmm. man is an emerging God. And Alan Watts, who was an Episcopal priest who became a Zen Buddhist monk, said, Within our hearts, uh, Eastern mysticism, Zen uh, meditation, unveils a vast area where at last self is indistinguishable from God. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could go on and on. Right, we could add the Worldwide quote. Church of God, which right. talks about God reproducing himself, and obviously Mormonism, which you, uh, you know, wrote a book about. Right. So that is the lie. Mm -hmm. Man has bought it. Mm -hmm. But in the world, uh, when we talk about humanism and we talk about atheism, the bottom line for those is that you know, if man is the measure of all things, or if there is no God and we're all there is, then we have to be God as well. Or well, if pantheism, which is really what it is, as right. you said, uh, there are only the two things, Christianity or pantheism, well, if everything is God, or we're part of God, then you're God and I'm God, and we are really little devils, little demons, having joined Satan's rebellion. It's a horrible thing to, to contemplate. Most of the cults believe to some degree in man's divinity. Mormons believe that man can become a god. The Worldwide Church of God teaches that God is reproducing himself in man. Christian science, unity, religious science, and Eastern cults regard man as divine. You may now stop the tape and discuss these ideas in relationship to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. The idea of being gods, I mean, we know and that's the lie of Satan in the Garden of Eden. He began with Satan as his ambition. Right. He passed it on to us. And, to th you know, we can understand this from a standpoint of pagan religions and, mm -hmm. and uh, even the world in terms of its humanistic ideas, mm -hmm. that they're the measure of all things. Mm -hmm. But it's really incredible to see this idea coming into the church, the evangelical church. I, I never thought it, Tom. But the Bible does predict it. And the apostasy, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, you know, verse mm -hmm. 3, that day, the day of the Lord, will not come except there comes an apostasy mm -hmm. first. And it goes on and explains what that apostasy is, that all those who receive not the love of the truth to really love the truth, to, and Jesus is the truth, to really love him, and to love the truth that we're sinners, and that he died for us, and that we need him totally. All those who receive not the love of the truth will be given by God a strong delusion to believe a lie. That's, that's frightening language. It's not right. that God is deliberately deluding us, but there's a time coming when man has gone so far He's going to help them believe what they want to believe. Mm. If they want to believe that they're gods and they can do it, then he's going to help them. He's going to help this delusive process, mm. and they will receive a strong delusion to believe the lie. The lie. This is it that we're talking mm. about, that yeah. we're gods. But we're talking about um, the church, uh, even uh, it's those, who, those who adhere to this book. The Word of God. So how could do. a concept of God be acceptable, you know, um, be nothing more than anathema? Uh, I mean, it should be anathema to... Uh... Well, uh, their concept of God, I don't think, has changed. They would still acknowledge God for who he is, but 
Amazingly, they go to some of the same scriptures that the cultists go to. Now, ten years ago, when I tried to tell people that Mormons believed they were going to become gods, Christians would say, now wait a minute, you must be maligning these good people, you must have misunderstood what they, nobody could believe they're going to become gods. Now we have people within the evangelical church who are not teaching we're going to become gods, they're teaching we are gods. And they're using some of the same uh, verses that the Mormons and other cultists and occultists used to love, like John 10, 34, Psalm 82, verse 6, and so forth, where Jesus said, Is it not written in your law, I have said, you are gods? And they say, you see, it says we're gods. In Psalm 82, 6, God says, I have said you are gods. It's obviously not very complimentary because he goes on to say, but you will die like men. Mm -hmm. Well, where did God say that we are gods? The only place that I know that he said this is in Genesis, Genesis 3, verse 22, where he says, the man has become as one of us. How did the man become as one of us? By believing the lie of the serpent. You can be like the gods. And he got it through disobedience. Uh, it was against the commandment of God. Mm -hmm. uh, it destroyed man as God intended him to be. And therefore, God expelled him from the Garden of Eden because he would not perpetuate man. It's not good. But yet, they're taking it, as, as you said earlier, uh, that man was created to have dominion over this earth, to be the god of this world. Satan stole that dominion. Now it's up to man to take that dominion back mm -hmm. and begin to function as the god of this world again. Mm -hmm. You know, there's another subtle way, at least it seems to me, that this idea of God who can, for example, so those that would not accept the idea that you just laid out. There's also a kind of godhood related to the innate goodness of man to a kind of a self-deification that comes through, we found in psychology. Mm -hmm. I'm talking primarily about um, psychological counseling, which has to do with uh, the model of man. Well, of course, they, uh, they wouldn't go so far as to say that we're gods, but the implication is there. If we have an infinite potential, if we really are the innocent victims, of traumas suffered in childhood, our parents abused us, or society, or whatever, then um, we're back to that point. But, um, I mean, the Word of God makes it very clear. Jeremiah 10, verse 11, God says, you say to the gods, any, any gods out mm -hmm. there, whether they're demons or humans or whoever pretends to godhood, you say to the gods that haven't made the heavens and the earth, they will perish from this earth and from under this heaven. That's the bottom line. That's the judgment that God pronounces upon all pretenders to godhood. And I think that we've got about, well, Satan's promise did become true. I mean, we did become little gods, and God himself says, I've said you're gods, but he didn't tell us that we were going to, he didn't tell Eve she was going to be a false God, a grasper after Godhood, a pretender having joined his rebellion, and we got about 4.6 billion little gods running around this world today. And the only hope is for every one of these little gods to abdicate the throne of their hearts and to come under willing submission to the one true God. You may now stop the tape and read John chapter 10, verses 34 through 36 and discuss whether or not Jesus was complimenting the Jews or rebuking them. We mentioned earlier that the lie, the lie that we are gods, it's, you know, it's given by, the sat by Satan in the Garden of Eden, and then we see it really from Genesis, the Revelation, mm -hmm. and that it is a lie that, that's changed somewhat. I want to go through some of those with you. The, <clears throat> in Genesis, uh, verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 5, it says, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is the serpent's lie to Eve. Right. And then, as you mentioned before, in Genesis 3, verse 22, it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. Mm -hmm. So, God is saying that this, this came about but not in the sense of being 
God, the, the, the true and living God. Let me just comment on that. <coughs> Uh, why you could ask why wouldn't God want man to know good and evil? <clears throat> because man cannot know good and evil. Um, and you've got to understand there that the only way that man knew, now knew good and evil was in his conscience. For the first time, Adam and Eve had a guilty conscience. It's not possible for us to decide from within ourselves what is good and what is evil. Only God can say that. If that were not the case, then we're in a situation where there are no moral absolutes, and every man does what is right in his own eyes, mm -hmm. and we are a God unto ourselves. So when God says that, it's almost with tongue in cheek. The man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Well, the only way he knows it is, we can't let man, as we cast him out of the garden, he has rebelled and he's been cut off from the life, that his life, which was God mm -hmm. uh, in him, he was made in the image of God. So now, at least to have some restraint, he's got a conscience, and he knows. And that this conscience was written in every man's heart by God himself. But it's not something innate from within us. It's clear from Romans uh, chapter 2. Mm -hmm. Well, let me pick up on, just continue, to continue through the scriptures on the same idea of the lie. In Isaiah 14, 13, it says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Mm -hmm. This is Satan, right? right. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, he succumbed to his own delusion, his own lie. And I think, Tom, uh, university professors, for example, who think that uh, there is no... God except the cosmos, mm -hmm. and who worship the cosmos, you know, like Carl Sagan, the pagan. Uh, uh, I believe they have believed Satan's lie. I think Satan is a self-deluded being mm -hmm. who really believes that somehow there is a power out here within the universe that he can grasp by following these laws that govern it, that God has made to govern it, and that he can tear the, the reins of the universe out of God's hands, and he can begin to function like this. I think he's a self-deluded being. Mm -hmm. um, and human beings who believe this lie become self-deluded also. The occultists, I mean, they are just obsessed with this idea that they're going to get this power. You know, in Isaiah 47, uh, God is really chiding the sorcerers, the, the diviners, mm -hmm. the soothsayers, and so on, mm -hmm. to turn now in their time in which his judgment is going to fall, to turn to their gods and see if they can bail mm -hmm. them out. But it's very interesting, in <clears throat> Isaiah 47, 8, the beginning of where God is talking about this judgment going to fall on Babylon, he says, Therefore, hear this now, you who are given to pleasure, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am, mm -hmm. and there is no one else besides me. Mm -hmm. Now that's Godhood. That's a pretending... Tom, I've talked to so many atheists, for example, mm -hmm. who say, I trust in myself. I'm not going to look to somebody else, not only for a standard, some mm -hmm. higher authority, but I'm going to trust to myself. And you've got so much out there not only in psychotherapies, but it's come within our public schools called values clarification. Mm -hmm. We don't look to any moral standard, don't impose any authority on these children, but, but teach them how to look within and be an authority unto themselves and be true to themselves. You've got to stand on your own feet. I am God, you know. They may not say it in exactly those terms, but it's exactly what it means. Mm -hmm. I'll pick up on this to move. I'm going to go to Daniel, but I think Daniel is referring in these scriptures to the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. In Daniel 8:11, it says, "He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host." Mm -hmm. In Daniel 11:36, it says, "Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished." Mm -hmm. Now, this idea of being a god, now, of course, he's talking about the, the end times. Mm -hmm. The idea in the Old Testament, God was an external kind of, uh, you know, even the patriarchs looked to God mm -hmm. not within the temple, 
Mm-hmm. I mean, the temple of the body, but outside. Mm-hmm. Well, when Christ mm-hmm. came in the resurrection, uh, the Holy Spirit came to dwell within us mm-hmm. after Pentecost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, that idea of an external God and these false gods that, that were worshipped by the pagans, these external gods, now has turned, hasn't it, for this day and this time, to looking within to find God. Well, that's right. It's the goal of yoga, self-realization, mm-hmm. to re- realize that I am God. And the scriptures you were reading there in Daniel point to that man of sin who's going to come and you have the same terminology Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, he exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You've got the same thing in Revelation chapter 13, where the whole world will worship this man as God, mm-hmm. not as the true God of the Bible, but as a self-realized master. And the powers that he have will be seem to be the pledge or the promise that we too, everyone can gain these powers, and we can manifest this godhood. You know, I think it's significant that Proverbs and other scriptures tell us the fear of the Lord, the fear of God, is the beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And there is very little fear of God, as we we already said. And uh, it just isn't taught. From our pulpits, um, you see it on Christian television, for example. It's just kind of a of a rah rah club, you know. And we can do these great things, and you know, we say this or think this or speak it, you know. And God's going to yeah. come through for us. And it just seems that God is our servant to make us successful, to heal us. Or he's a warm puppy, or he's a friendly psychiatrist, right. or the world has him right. as George Burns, and you know, and oh God. Yeah. Let me just read some scriptures. Their throat, well, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. This is Romans 3, verse 11. They don't really seek the true God, they seek a God who will be their servant. And I'm, I'm letting the Spirit of God speak to my heart, you know. Our hearts are all the same. Right. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We need to be in awe of him. Mm -hmm. You know, on the other side of that coin, um, the lie, the deception that we could be as God, or that we could be, we're talking about finite, I mean, <laughs> not just fallen, but finite, limited um, uh, creatures. Such such helpless, hopeless failures right. we really right. are. So to pre- presume and to pretend, uh, to be deluded with the idea that you could be a God and that you could take command is a, I mean, it's a burden we talked before about legalism. I mean, it's something that then, if you're God, it rests upon your shoulders. If you're going to manipulate and, and bring everything into a being uh, to create reality with your mind, with these ideas that are primarily sorcery, mm-hmm. um, you're, you're stuck with it. So you get what, uh, what you're going to do. And no wonder the Bible calls it the lie of lies. This is the lie. Mm. And you've got to really be deluded to believe that. But in contrast, Revelation 5, Mm. verse 20 says, this is, we know that the Son of God has come, Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, that we might know him that is true, we are in him that is true. To give us an understanding, it says, he's Mm. come. This is the true God, and eternal life, and then it warns, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Let me read a scripture to close. Jeremiah 16, 19, and 20. O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles 
shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthlessness, and unprofitable things. Will a man make gods for himself, which are not gods? There's a realization that the world will come to at some point in time. Right. When the Bible talks about self, um, there are so many ideas that we, we find related to self that are becoming popular today. But when the scriptures talk about self, uh, what does it mean? Well, Tom, I suppose that would be difficult to define because the Bible doesn't give you a definition of self, but it tells you some things about self. Mm -hmm. um, and first of all, I mean, most obvious, Jesus says, except a man deny himself right. and take up the cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. I would think that self would be m myself, independent from God, independent of God. Uh, the idea that I can do something, that must be denied my will, everything that I am, in fact. Jesus said, I must even hate my own life. Right. And, and, and I must lose, be willing to lose my life in order to gain it. If I cling to life, mm -hmm. I'm going to lose it. But if I give it up, I'll find the real life. Yeah. That's Matthew 16. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Mm -hmm. So that's the heart, isn't it? In Jeremiah 10:23, 23, a, a powerful scripture that every Christian really ought to have memorized. I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Uh, we are made in the image of God. And that means we're not self-contained. And he's, we're more like a um, television set. Uh, it's the power of God, it's the life of God to be lived through us. Mm -hmm. And when we try to be self-contained entities, even the personalities in the Trinity do not operate independently. Jesus um, said in John's Gospel, chapter 5, and verse 30, mm -hmm. I can, when he's living and walking as a man here on the earth, I can of mine own self do nothing. But then, in uh, John 16, I think it's around uh, verse 13, verse 13. Uh, he says, when he, the spirit of truth, will come, he will lead you into all truth, for he will not speak of himself. I remember when I used to think that meant he won't talk about himself, but of course it doesn't mean that. It no. means he will not speak on his own initiative. He will on not his own act, authority. Right. He, right, he will not act independently. So, even the members of the Godhead do not act independently of one another. Then how could we possibly act independently of God? So I think that this self that he wants us to deny must be an attempt to act independently right. of God. So it's becoming an emptied vessel, emptied of self-will, and which the Lord fills with himself to do his will. Right. Mm -hmm. You may now stop the tape and give some examples of this generation's preoccupation with self. Also read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and discuss its relationship to self. The ideas that we've discussed related to self, a biblical view, they're really at odds with what the world considers self to be. Do you agree? Well, uh, not with what the world considers self to be, because they think of self as autonomous. Right. But they're certainly at odds with what the world wants to do with do. self. Right. 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 And uh, in contrast to what Jesus said, deny self, mm -hmm. the world says, actualize self, improve self, develop self-confidence, mm -hmm. uh, self-assertion, uh, a good self-image, love self. And in view of what the Bible says, it's incredible that these ideas, under the umbrella of psychology that mm -hmm. gives them ostensibly scientific, uh, the imprimatur of science, uh, well, although it's not scientific, but they come in then under mm -hmm. psychology, and we begin to accept the very ideas from the world that are the opposite of what the Bible says about self. Well, it's, it's really a tough thing to deal with, because um, self, we're, we tend to be self-biased, uh, preserving, um, defensive, uh, the whole... Well, we're self-centered. We right. want to protect self. 
And I guess the primary instinct, I would agree with psychology on that point, the primary instinct, and apparently we picked it up, I would say, in the Garden of Eden, right. is self-preservation. Mm -hmm. God said you're going to die. Satan said, if you disobey me, Satan said you can have a life independent of God, you can know what is good and what is evil without accepting his standards. It was mm -hmm. man's declaration of independence. Mm -hmm. and now we're going to preserve this autonomy at all costs. And Jesus said, you're going to have to be willing to give it up. Mm -hmm. Give it back to me. And then I will give you the true life that you were okay. uh, destined for. So the world has really picked up on the lie of Satan, that self could be as God. And they're going in that direction. Mm -hmm. So then the hope is in self. Right. So we're talking about human potential. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about an infinite potential that is within us, in spite of the fact that the Bible says it's not in man to direct him, his steps. The way of man is not in himself, but they're looking into themselves through all kinds of therapies, what, get in touch with yourself, mm -hmm. get in touch with your feelings, or self-realization, uh, yoga, etc. Uh, self-assertion if somebody's timid and... That's the heart. Develop your self-confidence. And they even talk about having faith in self. Right. Right. Now, related to self and the self-isms that we're starting to hear, and we've been hearing for quite a while, well, let's go over a couple of them. The, in some cases, they're, they just don't make in, they're not common sense. Uh, for example, hating self and loving self. Um, what do, you, what do you feel about uh, the idea that we hate ourselves and now we have to learn to love ourselves? Well, I mean, that's not even rational. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5... Yeah, but, I mean, people will tell you right away, no, I hate myself. Yeah, they've been told that by the psychologists, but they don't hate themselves. I mean, somebody says, I hate, I'm so ugly, I hate myself. Well, if you hated yourself, you <clears throat> pardon me, you would be glad that you were ugly. <clears throat> you were never upset because somebody you hated was ugly. Uh, I hate I hate myself, so I'm going to commit suicide. You know. Uh, well, uh, for example, I was counseling with a man who was in that position. He had done things for, for which he ought to go to prison. And I said to him, "You," he said, "I hate myself. I'm going to kill myself." I said, "You think of suicide as an escape. You never helped anybody you hate to escape." And if you hated yourself, you'd be perfectly willing to stand in front of a judge and confess your crimes, and you'd enjoy seeing yourself suffer in prison. So this thing, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, so it's a matter of, it's circumstance. It's not self that we hate. We love self, but it's the circumstance that we want to get out of, move away from. So. Or the way people respond to us. But right. then it gets even worse. Infinite human potential, developing self, getting in touch with self, and then they begin to talk about the higher self. Ah, there is a higher self that we can all get tuned into, and it's in all of us, uh, depending on whether it's union or, or, or whatever, uh, mystical idea. And that, of course, is a substitute for God. And you see the little shift that's been made. Now God becomes self, or self becomes God. Mm -hmm. And that's the heart of this generation, isn't it? Uh, the selfism, the narcissism, the, uh, the turning to self to solve the problems which they have not yet solved, but this higher consciousness, this higher self, is going to do the job. Supposedly. Doesn't work. Right. Hasn't worked yet. You may now stop the tape and read Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 11, and discuss self in relationship to the life and statements of Jesus. You know, we talk about the world and the concept of self in the world. And uh, in this me generation, right. um, this is really the doctrine of the day. And it's incredible, it seems, that th this doctrine has now been picked up by the church and it's become a, a doctrine within evangelical Christianity. Um, a new doctrine, Tom, because if you go back, read um, A.W. Tozer, Moody, Torrey, Finney, Spurgeon, Andrew Murray, etc. You will not find this. It has only come into, first of all, Christian writings and then Christian pulpits who picked it up from these writers within the last 20 years or so. And it comes through psychology. 
Mm -hmm. uh, men did not pick up the idea that we all hate ourselves, we have to learn to love ourselves, we need to build up our self-esteem, our self-acceptance, accept ourselves. Uh, they did not pick that up by uh, studying the Word of God on their knees in prayer, uh, but they picked it up from out here. It was an outside influence uh, from the world around them, the right. theories of the world, but then they began to try to fit the scriptures into it because they want to be academically respected mm -hmm. and they want to be scientifically sound, supposedly, but they believe some lies that are not scientific. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think some I, some of these ideas uh, in our research we found uh, Eric Fromm, and he got the idea to a degree from Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche. Right. Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. um, well, and Nietzsche, amazingly, or or Fromm actually, um, amazingly, since he's a godless atheist, uh, one of his books, for example, was titled. Ye shall be as gods. So he takes the very lie of the serpent and makes it the title of one of his books. And in his book, Man for Himself, that he wrote in 1947, Eric Fromm justified this idea that we need to love ourselves, that we all hate ourselves, and we need, first of all, to love ourselves. He justified it by saying, Jesus taught this when he said, Love your neighbor as yourself. Right. Um, well, let's go into that scripture. True. Let's go into Matthew 22, verse 36 to 40. I mean, uh, we hear it being promoted as uh, three commandments. From the best pulpits. Right. Uh, uh, Jesus was asked, what is the great commandment? He said, the first and great commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two hang all the law and the prophets. Well, now we've had a third one introduced the love of self, that we have to love self before we can love either God or neighbor. But Jesus said on these two, now, they talk about a healthy self-love, as though we have a deficient self-love. I mean, if we all were deficient in self-love, Jesus couldn't say to everybody out there, he doesn't say it to a certain class of people who've taken a psychological course in loving themselves, right. he says to everyone, Love your neighbor as yourself. So that's a given. We must already love ourselves. And he couldn't say, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. He says that to everyone. If we all innately hated ourselves and wanted to do ourselves in. Ephesians 5, again, says, No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. Mm -hmm. So it's an idea that came from psychology that was picked up, um, first of all, by Robert Schuller in his book, Self-love, the dynamic force of success, and now it has moved through the church, and you will hear it from the best pulpits. Men who seem to be very sound and biblical otherwise, but they have picked this thing up about self-esteem and self-love. Mm -hmm. It's also opened the door to uh, psychotherapies, Christianized psychotherapies, to develop self, to esteem self, to assert self. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, what scriptures would would support those kinds of ideas? You can't find them, Tom. The scripture would tell you exactly the opposite. Uh, Philippians 2, 3, for example, says, Let each esteem others better than himself. Mm -hmm. um, Romans 12, verse 2, We are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but they will take that scripture amazingly and say, We've got to be careful not to think too poorly or too lowly. Of, of ourselves. But, you know, one of the best ways that I know of explaining it is to go back to Genesis 1, verse 26, where it says, God made man in his image. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you think of when you think of an image is a mirror. And a mirror has one purpose, <clears throat> and one purpose only, that is to reflect a reality other than its own. Now, what would you think of a mirror that tries to develop a good self-image? It's an absurdity. It's an absurdity. If there's something wrong with the image in the mirror, the mirror needs to get back in a right relationship with the one whose image it was designed to reflect. But instead of being turned to God and a relationship with Him, we're being turned to ourselves. So we've got a self-image psychology. The scripture says, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into His image. 
But we're being taught today what we need to do is visualize a good self-image like we want ourselves to be and focus upon this self-image, self-image psychology, and then we will be transformed into that image. It is absolutely the opposite of, the Bi of what the Bible teaches, and it is destructive to biblical Christianity. Yeah. It ends up being a form of legalism as well. I mean, if I have to develop self, if I have to uh, esteem self or lift st self to exalt self to a point of just being able to function, uh, that can be a crushing thing because even if I think I've got it all working and going right, uh, it's built upon a foundation of not trusting in the Lord, not depending on Him, but trying to develop what I can develop. Well, again, the center in itself, uh, love, love God and love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself then? Well, um, what do you do in the morning when you get up? You brush your teeth, you comb your hair, you feed yourself, you clothe yourself. Treat your neighbor as you treat yourself. And you could even interpret it as meaning as you have loved yourself, instead of loving yourself, love your neighbor. Uh, you have been self-centered and selfish, which we certainly all are. Now turn from yourself to others, and we need to think of others, esteem others more highly than we esteem ourselves. It is selfishness that is at the heart of the problems within families. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not responding to me. Uh, I'm not getting a fair deal in this. Uh, it's I, my, me. Right. And when we forget ourselves and we turn from self to others, then God is able to bless us and bless the others through us. You may now stop the tape and read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, and discuss how self, through the current ideas and practices, can quickly become another foundation. In going back to the the way the world views self i mean self is mm -hmm. autonomous self is in charge you become the master of your faith the captain mm -hmm. of your own ship um mm -hmm. but related to a biblical perspective that we're to have only one foundation and that foundation being christ jesus mm -hmm. now i'd like to go over some of the scriptures that deal with why we can't build the foundation upon self Mm -hmm. you know, for example, in Proverbs, it says, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Jeremiah 17, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Mm -hmm. So there must be dead, something wrong with the heart. You're beating a dead horse, uh, first of all, uh, our weakness, trusting in ourselves instead of in God. But then, as you say, there's something wrong with the heart. No wonder Jesus said, Deny self. Because Jeremiah tells us the heart is deceitful above all things <clears throat> and, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. And no wonder David in Psalm 139 said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Who is the way? Jesus mm -hmm. is the way. I am the way, the truth, the life, he said. Mm -hmm. And I can think of another proverb. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but in the end... The end are over the ways of death. death. Right. And I, I'd like to give you two other scriptures. One in uh, related to deception, when Jeremiah's talking about the heart being deceitful, desperate mm -hmm. with it. Obadiah 3 says, The pride of your heart has deceived you. So right. now we're, ha we're talking about self, self-esteem, right. some right. of these ideas. It's deceptive mm -hmm. at best. Mm -hmm. um, in Hosea 10.13, You have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way. Mm -hmm. Now, based, as we're basing ideas upon self, all mm -hmm. of these selfisms. In Jesus, um, I don't know if I can find it quickly here. Um, but in <coughs> in Matthew 15, verses 19 and 20, and you've got it in other parts also, mm -hmm. he says, Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, 
blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Our hearts are not only deceitful, but they're corrupt, desperately wicked. And it's from within and from self uh, that we are defiled. No wonder Jesus said you've got to deny self and take up the cross and follow me. And given the heart of man, that's basically evil. I mean, I'd like to look to Jesus, even in the man of the perfect heart, the God-man, mm -hmm. what he said related to self and his position. I want to read uh, Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Now, that would be uh, not exactly exalting self, or not exactly dealing with self-esteem uh, in the way that we're, we're hearing it today. <coughs> You're not going to have that talk to you out there in the business world, Tom. And, uh, I mean, nobody teaches that. And it's the, it's these ideas from out there that have corrupted the church from within. So you don't get this taught, um, within the church either. And Jesus, again, we already quoted it, said, I can of mine own self do nothing. You wouldn't get the idea that you've got to have a good self image. You've got to feel good about yourself. Uh, you've got to accept yourself. I mean, well, what about the patriarchs? What about the prophets? What about weren't these men of uh, of self confidence and, and high self esteem and uh, real? Well, Tom, if what we've been saying is true, and if they knew anything about their own hearts, I mean, how could anyone who knows that his heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, that he is uh, cannot direct his own steps, that we are prone to sin and to be deceived by our own lusts? How could you have a good self-image? I don't see how you could. So, hey, well, uh, these were men of great accomplishment, though. Uh, <coughs> so what did they have going for them? Not the accomplishment wasn't in themselves. Of course, Tom, the way to get a good, if you want to get an accurate self-image, it's not what they call a good self-image, take a look at him. In Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up. And John 12 tells us this was when he saw the glory of Jesus. Uh, and his train filled the temple and so forth. And he says, Then said I, Woe is me. I am undone. I don't know of any man or woman in the Word of God that was really used of God that had what they would call today a good self-image or high self-esteem. Take Moses, for example. <clears throat> in um, Exodus 3, when God called Moses to go to Egypt to deliver his people, Moses said, I can't do it, Lord. I'm no deliverer. And in chapter 4, he said, I can't even talk. Uh, get somebody else. I mean, don't use me. I'm no good. And he had as, as bad a self-esteem, as low a self-esteem, and as bad a self-image as anybody could, could have. Mm -hmm. And we don't read that God said, Moses, your problem is, you got a bad self-image, and I'm going to give you about six months of Christian psychotherapeutic counseling. And we're going to build up your self-esteem, your self-acceptance, your self-love, your self-image, and we're going to teach you, you know, a little body language and psychological techniques to get people to do what you want them to do, and you become a fantastic deliverer, Moses. But God, in contrast, said, I will be with thee. I will be with thee. And we're being robbed of the presence and power of God in our lives by turning to ourselves. And in fact, the scripture seems to indicate <clears throat> that God chose Moses because he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. And he chose the meekest man on the face of the earth to confront the mightiest emperor in his palace on his turf to deliver his people from his grip so that God would have the glory and no man would have the glory. But, what, but this was before the cross. What about after the cross where we have uh, a new self? And I mean, what about Paul? Paul accomplished great things. 
Yes, well, Paul, um, <clears throat> uh, in, as he wrote to Timothy, uh, he didn't say, I was the chief of sinners. <laughs> he said, of whom I am the chief. Uh, he didn't say in Romans 7, wretch that I was. He said, wretch that I am. And I don't know, uh, Tom, I don't know where people get these ideas, uh, but you will hear even pastors from the pulpit saying, Paul had a good, positive self-image, <clears throat> a high self-esteem. Well, uh, see if I can find it here very quickly. I mean, you know the scriptures. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, for example. He says, well, he said, Paul says that Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says he didn't choose many mighty. He didn't mm -hmm. choose many wise. He chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He chose the weak of this world to confound the mighty. Uh, this is God's way, but we think that God can't use us or he wouldn't even love us until we have a high self-esteem. Most gladly, therefore, Paul says, will I glory in my infirmities, that is, in my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. <clears throat> therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And I mean persecutions, distresses, reproaches, necessities. Tom, it's These are the very exact, negative things. It's the exact opposite of what, what we're getting out there. Right. Because it does sound negative. But it's reality, isn't it? Well, it's God's will. Mm -hmm. It's God's way. Mm -hmm. Jesus took the way of the cross. You read it. He humbled himself. He came obedient unto death, even death upon the cross. And we are to have that same mind in us. Now, that's not popular, but the old hymn says, I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There is no other way but this. I will ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. Deny self, take up the cross, and follow me. Now, I don't know how you can massage that around and reinterpret it to make it compatible with this psychological uh, methodology that has been introduced into the church. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I'd like to comment on is that in... Second Timothy chapter 3, where it talks about the last days, that there will be perilous times, right. that men will be lovers of self. Mm -hmm. And I find that interesting because it has nothing, the Greek there doesn't deal with self-preservation or, you know, taking care of yourself. It has to do with affections. And mm -hmm. I don't know any other generation. High self-esteem, in other words. Exactly. Right. Uh, feeling good about yourself. Right. Right? So forth. Somebody that Jesus talked about who felt bad about himself. You know, the Pharisee and the publican. Yeah, I'm going to read that scripture. <clears throat> they, I would say the publican had a very good self. I mean, the Pharisee had a very good self image and the well, publican had a very bad one. Well, let me read that. It's Luke 18.9. And Jesus is saying, Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves mm -hmm. that they were righteous and despised mm -hmm. others. Two men, up to the, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. And that's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what he was talking to do. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust. Tom, let me just interject here. Because one of the popular concepts today is positive self-talk. Right. You've got to tell yourself just what the Pharisee says. I'm a good guy. I'm okay. I mean, I pray and I fast and, and get high on yourself and, and say some good things about yourself because that'll help build up your feeling, positive feelings about yourself. So, And then he turned to the, uh, the tax collector. He says, even as this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be abased, and he who humbles himself 
will be exalted. The book of Jonah, this is chapter 2, verse 8 in the NIV, it says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk about Christianized humanism. Mm -hmm. and it seems to me that scripture really deals with the idea that what we use, what man uses to supplement the Word of God, whether it be techniques and methodologies, even moving towards spirituality. But mm -hmm. as we turn from the scriptures to these techniques and these devices, we're really forfeiting the, the grace and the power of God in our lives to the extent that we displace Him. Like in John 10, those who climb up, I am the door, but those who climb up some other way, they're not going to get in. They mm -hmm. may think they're going to get in. They're thieves and robbers. Mm -hmm. And so they, they miss the benefits that God has for right. them. But that brings us back to Scripture, with in this day where we see all kinds of supplements, all kinds of ways and techniques and approaches and so on to uh, living not just a godly life, but uh, make things work for us in our own mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. um, now, do the Scriptures claim to be sufficient in that area? This book, the Bible, claims to be the manufacturer's handbook. In Throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, you get that thought. But, for example, I would recommend uh, to any Christian who really wants to get into this, read Psalm 119, for example. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, all the way from the beginning of Psalm 119, it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. On through the scriptures thy word has made me wiser. Than, than my teachers, than my instructors, on down to thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. I have sworn and I will perform it. I will keep thy righteous judgments. You go on into Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. I don't know what else you need in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be perfect, mature, complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. I, I don't know how much stronger language you can make than that. Uh, Peter tells us, and let me just read it. Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Right. He says, according as his divine power hath given, he's given to us mm -hmm. in his wisdom, his grace and by his power, everything that we need, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him, not the knowledge of other things, but through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Promises of what? Right. Wealth, success, prosperity. It says that by these, these promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Lust for what? Lust for possessions. And Jesus himself said, man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesseth. And yet we are being offered ostensibly through faith, mm -hmm. um, uh, things, success of the world that is measured in the abundance of the beautiful things that we possess. And Tom, I mean, I've talked to so many people, I'm thinking of a young couple right now who are in a church and they are not very successful. He happens to be blind uh, and um, does not have all the benefits of earning a, a, a plush salary that a lot of other people do. And they say somehow they just haven't found a place there because every, every, when they go to the gatherings, you know, at church or the couples, the young couples' uh, home fellowships, Everybody's talking about the, uh, the, you know, the vacation they're going to take in Hawaii or the condo they're buying up in the mountains or the new house that they're getting. And, and that seems to be their life, their idea of the blessings of God. And this young couple can't relate to it. And I don't believe that it's biblical. Not that God won't bless us. Mm -hmm. But that's not the primary emphasis of the Word of God. You may now stop the tape and read Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. Then discuss what this scripture might have to do with a Christianized form of humanism. Well, 
these ideas, uh, somehow, I mean, the world believes that uh, we can raise ourselves up by our own bootstraps. The humanism is obviously the, the philosophy of the day. God helps them and helps themselves. Right. You know, they... right. Well, what is humanism? What really is it? Well, humanism is simply focusing upon man. Mm -hmm. It makes man the center and the measure of everything. So we are getting a God, uh, uh, instead of a God-centered, we're getting a man-centered gospel. Mm -hmm. It's all for our benefit. Uh, very little to the glory of God. Thy kingdom, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, not our Cadillacs. I mean, I'm not saying that God may not bless you, and we ought to be diligent, we ought to do the best job we can. But read the, listen to the Lord's Prayer again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever, honoring him, fearing him, loving, worshiping him, but it's centered in what do we get out of it. Mm -hmm. But that's the heart of the world. I mean, it's our hearts right. as well that have, uh, even that are in submission to the Lord, but it's our, you know, it's something that we carry with us, a self-bias, self-serving bias, this preservation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it relates, Tom, to this idea, ultimately, of course, that man is God that we talked about. And Henri de Lubeck, uh, one of the leading humanists of the last century, in his book, Atheistic Humanism, mm -hmm. said, the transformation will come when man finally realizes that the only God for man is man himself. Mm -hmm. And, of course, this is the heart of the New Age movement today, right. which is looking forward to this transformation yeah well, let's let's talk a little bit about the new age and the new consciousness now uh, 10 15 years ago when we were still in a kind of we had a materialist view mm -hmm. of you know at least science had a you know a materialist view of uh, mm -hmm. of what was going on now we've shifted from not being able to solve our problems from that perspective to almost a spiritual view, a new spirituality, a kind of mystical view. Mm -hmm. Well, you say from not being able to solve our problems, in other words, the admission that yeah. science had, had run into a dead end, mm -hmm. uh, and science, for all of its accomplishments, is about to destroy our ecology, our environment, and has brought us to the brink of a nuclear holocaust. Um, it doesn't... Uh, satisfy the inner longings of the human heart mm -hmm. and so through the drug movement uh, that we've talked about our young people experience some kind of a dimension out here that they never knew existed they were off on trips uh, that's why they called it a trip uh, they were experiencing other worlds and other dimensions and it was real uh, and those people are today's Psychiatrists, psychologists, university professors, leading politicians, our doctors and lawyers, we're being fed the sorcerer's gospel mm -hmm. from the top down now. Mm -hmm. And they have believed the delus delusion that the answer is within, mm -hmm. within man. Mm -hmm. But what they want to do, again, going back to it, they want to solve man's problems. Is that right? Well, yeah. But in a way that is man-centered, Right. without it being to the glory of God mm -hmm. uh, and with a confusion between who God is and who man is now it's become blurred and and so it's for our our good and that seems to be the great benefit mm -hmm. and again you know we we talk about Christianized humanism the heart of it the heart of what we're talking about really is self that self can do it that self has the potential, infinite potential from some mm -hmm. perspectives. Um, but it's not working out. I mean, psychology, the heart of psychology is self. The heart of psychology is that man is an innately good, humanistic psychology. He's the measure of all things. And mm -hmm. 
can do it. It's just thinking it's wrong. But where where have we come in? You know, it's a relatively new field, psychology. But you become, it's gotten worse, hasn't it? You become very very lonely. All of the meisms, and I've talked to too many people who have practiced transcendental meditation, yoga. They looked within to find the answers, to find that they were God, and they said it becomes very lonely. And I believe that that's, in a sense, what hell is going to be. God doesn't want anybody to be there, but they will right. be separated from the giver of life, and they will have themselves to live with and to draw upon forever. And, you know, um, the old saying, uh, "Thou hast, from Augustine, Thou hast made us for Thyself, O God, and we are restless until we find our rest in thee. And when we try to find it within ourselves instead of in him, it's, it's, it dooms us to an eternal thirst for that for which God created us forever and forever. You may now stop the tape and discuss what you would consider to be a religious form of humanism related to Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. Dave, why has the church turned so many sources outside the Word of God? Well, Tom, I think there are probably a lot of reasons. One would be they're looking for a quick fix. Um, the scripture, you know, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life unto thou art also called. He says, you know my doctrine and manner of life, my purpose and the afflictions that came upon me, uh, and all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution and so forth. That's a pretty tough road to hold uh, in contrast to the success that we're offered in the world around us, mm -hmm. and why can't we have it as Christians? So, um, well, the, the biblical... Uh, teaching is not that appealing to modern man. So I think part of it is a temptation uh, to go after the delicious right. goodies that are out there, and of course we'll Christianize them and wrap them in biblical terminology in order to make them orthodox and acceptable. Right. You know, I think in Galatians 3.3 where it says, Are you so foolish <clears throat> after beginning with the Spirit, you're now trying to perfect your goal in the flesh? That's something that trips us all up, doesn't it? I mean, we start out and God does something wonderful, miraculous, maybe instant. Mm -hmm. And our penchant after a day or two, well, what is he going to do next? Or how am I going to make this work? And how can we have the same kind of success mm -hmm. when he may be wanting to work something else in our lives? And there's any number of therapies or success <coughs> motivation techniques or self-improvement tapes uh, mm -hmm. all being offered in the name of science, in the name of business success, and in fact, you really have to get into these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some large corporations where you've got to take New Age thinking, or you've got to take EST, or whatever, or mm -hmm. they'll get rid of you. Mm -hmm. So if it's legitimate out there, I mean, why not? You see, and right. if it works, that's another thing, pragmatism. Right. They seem to work, and their mm -hmm. testimonies have transformed lives, and mm -hmm. instead of coming to the cross, uh, I'm going to try these, and in fact, um, many of the uh, psychological counselors of various types, all the way from inner healers uh, to Christian psychologists, are coming right out and saying that the biblical methods don't work, that to come to the cross, to repent, confess your sins, acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and be filled with the Holy Spirit, it just doesn't work. They're not willing for to take the biblical way. They'll take a promise, maybe they're depressed or anxious. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God in the peace of God. The pass of all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. But they say, but I tried and it doesn't work. I guess it was okay for the days of the apostles, but... You know, we live in a very fast-moving world with electronic gadgets and so forth, and we mm -hmm. face uh, pressures that they didn't have. So we've got to borrow these psychotherapeutic techniques mm -hmm. 
uh, and supplement the Bible with them. Yeah, well, I like that. I like to talk about that a little bit more. Um, it seems when, you know, if I'm a pastor and I want to take an advanced degree, I can either go on and get a doctorate in theology, but most are turning because they want to help people. Mm -hmm. They'll turn to uh, a degree in psychology, again, mm -hmm. trying to help people. But mm -hmm. This is where they're drawn off. Don't you believe? Well, you get the impression that if you have not had a uh, sufficient training in psychology, you are not competent right. to handle the Word of God. You know, you say it's not biblical, but the... And it uh, doesn't work. Right, and it doesn't work. But I think the, the delusion is based on the idea, uh, let's, let's go to these methodologies, let's go to these techniques, let's go to these therapies, because all truth is God's truth, Mm -hmm. And it's going to be, you know, it, we're going to find it in these scientific uh, philosophies mm -hmm. and ideas. Or they will say, psychology is biblical. We learn biblical principles in psychology. Well, I'll learn them from the Bible mm -hmm. rather than from Freud or Jung. And I don't know any biblical mm -hmm. principles. If anything that they had was just common sense. Mm -hmm. But if all truth is God's truth, why do I have to dredge through the muck and mire of the, the filth and the corruption of the mm -hmm. theories of a Freud or Fromm or Jung or Rogers or Maslow or whatever in order to come up with some golden nugget of truth and then say, ah, it's biblical. Well, why not get it from the clear, pure uh, Word of God mm -hmm. in, in the first place? It, it just doesn't make sense. I don't know why these men are biblical and why they should be able to tell, improve on what the Holy Spirit has told us. You may now stop the tape and read 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. Then discuss how this relates to the tendency today to add the ideas of the world to the Word of God. There are two ideas that really open the door to uh, kind of Christianized humanism, and that's finding truth or finding some good no matter how polluted the well. And one idea would be that all truth is God's truth, which you mentioned, but there's another aspect to that. Can we really use that as a, a determining kind of idea that, that opens the door to use other kinds of things? Well, Jesus said, keep them, praying to his Father in John 17, keep them through thy truth. Mm -hmm. Thy word is truth. Mm -hmm. And Isaiah 8 verse 20 says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. So the word of God is the truth. Now, when they talk about truth, maybe it's common sense or maybe it's factual truth. Uh, but you wouldn't call uh, mathematical propositions or formulas in physics or chemistry truths in the sense that the Bible says. So I believe that the only truth is in the word of God. Now, he has written his law in our conscience. Right. So to that extent, we recognize it, and the true light, Jesus, has shined into every heart so that even a non-Christian knows that he's morally accountable and knows that he needs a Savior. But beyond that, I don't see any validity to saying that all truth is God's truth, as though there is a pool of truth outside of the Bible that supplements it. And Freud may have stumbled across it, or Jung may have stumbled across it, that simply is not true. Furthermore, we must measure everything by the Word of God. And if it's in the Word of God, why don't we take it from there? We just get back to that again. And you've got the same idea with throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Right. And you know, I often facetiously say, and you say the same thing, that tell me about the baby. I mean, I've asked a lot of people when it comes to psychology or whatever it is, well, should we throw the baby out with the bathwater? Well, tell me about the baby. I mean, I'd like to hear about it. I've never found anybody who could tell me about the baby. And I've strained the water, and I can't find the baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if it's there, you know, it's Rosemary's baby. So, uh... In a lot of cases, yeah, there's something there. Well, this idea, then opening the door to all these other kinds of, of techniques and methodologies and so on, now, let, me, let, me, yeah. let me stop right there, Tom, because maybe some people are feeling this is a little bit fanatical. I'm not against chemistry. Right. We're not against 
Um, anything that's scientific, and that part of psychology, see, one of the problems is there are, there are Christian leaders who recognize humanism in one form, and they're opposed to humanism out here. But in their books, they teach humanism in the form of psychology because they don't recognize it. Now, to whatever extent psychology is scientific, uh, learning deficiencies uh, right. or observations, observations right. of, of, of various things that, that are repeatable and so forth would be a very small part of psychology. We don't object to science in any form if it's valid. But you, you wouldn't talk about Christian chemistry or Christian physics, or Christian mm -hmm. medicine, because there's no such thing. Well, why do we talk about Christian psychology? Because psychology, unlike all of those other things, claims to deal with that which the Bible says it is, is its sole province. Mm -hmm. How you can be happy, how you can be fulfilled, how you can be a well-integrated personality. These are spiritual matters, and they can only be correctly uh, accomplished mm -hmm. through our relationship with God and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's impinging on something that the Bible says is its sole providence. Yeah, and it's another religion, humanism is another religion, and you cannot blend it. They're rival religions. You cannot blend it with Christianity. Right. Aren't we talking about the heart of man here that psychology is trying to deal with? And doesn't God say that the heart of man is de mm -hmm. deceitful above all things right. and desperately wicked? Mm -hmm. Who can know it? Right. So, uh, I mean, the psychiatrists that, can't know it. I mean, it's all subjective, it's all opinion, and it's mm -hmm. not even based on, uh, well, it's based on mythology, to be honest. And it doesn't work, I don't like to go over that again, but uh, there's no evidence out there, in mm -hmm. fact, all the evidence right. is to the contrary. But, you know, in some cases, we have to go over it again, because as we've planned all of these programs, you find that the area that opens the door the most right. to drawing us off, from the Word of God. And what's even worse, it seems to me, is now we are interpreting this book through a grid of right. a, a religious system, of a mythology, right. and now understanding the scriptures on that basis. Right. It's astonishing. Yeah. Well, l let me go to this point. The, uh, the scriptures really talk about living the godly life, walking with the Lord. That's mm -hmm. the heart of what mm -hmm. your life is about. Don't you agree? When Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mm -hmm. I am come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. What does that have to do with all those things out there? He has given us the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. The mind of Christ doesn't need any psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is get in line with the mind of Christ and mm -hmm. let him live his life through us. Which could be the fellowship of his sufferings, which Paul mm -hmm. comes for, mm -hmm. as well as, um, mm -hmm. you know, success, um, prosperity, as God wills, and as mm -hmm. it's good for us, mm -hmm. but which means the heart and being in conformity to his will. Mm -hmm. well, let, me, let me go through some of the scriptures related to that. In Col Colossians, mm -hmm. starting... In chapter 1, with verse 9, it says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, mm -hmm. that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Mm -hmm. Now, this has to move it out from under what I think is right and what mm -hmm. I think is good for me mm -hmm. and what the Lord knows. Mm -hmm. know, in his infinite wisdom, mm -hmm. being fruitful mm -hmm. in every good work mm -hmm. and increasing in the knowledge of God, mm -hmm. strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with mm -hmm. joy. Mm -hmm. That seems to me to be success, the victorious life. Mm -hmm. But that's a some of it's a little too negative for in, in, in the second chapter verse 8 of Colossians Tom it seems to just put the end to this whole idea of all truth is God's truth mm -hmm. it says beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ he doesn't say all truth is God's truth. He doesn't qualify this and say, except, of course, to the extent that, that they are really following uh, God's truth. He just says no. Right. 
an incredible thing. I mean, you can understand uh, worldliness, moving to techniques that seem to be outside the realm of spirituality, but it seemed to be. Mm -hmm. But now we're finding techniques, ideas, concepts mm -hmm. that are going to increase our spirituality, mm -hmm. methodologies. This is not being more efficient in business or accounting techniques or no. uh, business principles, sound business principles, but these are spiritual things. And of course, in humanistic and transpersonal psychology, they openly confess mm -hmm. that they want to get into the spiritual side of man, and the Bible has the only answers in that realm. Right. It's like going to the Philistines to see how they worship Baal, and then bringing it back, which uh, Israel stood right. convicted of. Right. Bringing it back for worshiping Jehovah. Right. right. In Second uh, Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth mm -hmm. and be turned aside to fables. Mm -hmm. and that's, the and that's exactly what it is. Right, and it is happening in our day. We're, I believe it's one of the signs of the last days. Things that um, the psychological principles, the therapies, I mean, you go on down the list, we list a lot of them in the book, uh, that are being introduced in the church today were not learned by men of God on their knees studying the Word of God under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. They were learned from the world of academia or success motivation or whatever around us, and then they have taken it and tried to Christianize it. Yeah. You know, it seems to me that even for a young Christian who is perplexed by these things, uh, if we just turn and look at I mean, we read the Bible, and God has given us these examples, and he's placed people in the Bible as examples. And I'm thinking about the Apostle Paul, mm -hmm. and he holds his life up as an example. I mean, I want to read some of these scriptures. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. Right. Be followers of me, even as I am of Christ, he said. Right. He said... The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, mm -hmm. these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. So it would seem that as we hear a new doctrine or a concept or an idea, mm -hmm. particularly one that's been Christianized, mm -hmm. um, to hold that to the life of Paul and see how this would have affected him or for an example in his life mm -hmm. of a manifestation of this idea and so on. Look at his life, a man who endured afflictions, a man who said, uh, I can do all things through Christ, but who wrote that from prison, right. and said, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound, everywhere in all things I instructed both to be full, to be empty, to abound, to suffer need. Then he says, I can do all mm -hmm. things through Christ. He's putting the emphasis upon the suffering and the deprivation that he endured. He was a man who said, when I'm weak, then am I strong. Mm -hmm. who, to whom Christ said, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect mm -hmm. in your weakness. A man who walked a humble path of obedience to the Lord and of service to his fellow men, and who did not seek his own, but who sought the good of others. Uh, a man who certainly was no example of success, was no example of not high self-esteem, right? not in today's terms, but of high self-esteem, but he said, there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me. Right. I fought the good fight, I finished the course, I have kept the faith, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, mm -hmm. and not for me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Mm -hmm. Now, so Christianized humanism, again, we have we kind of coined that term, but the idea is that we're displacing God. We're looking to other things, even in the with the idea that maybe it'll increase spirituality. But we're really displacing God. A right? subtle shift of authority right. Right. from the Word of God to Freud or you right. or some business success leader, mm -hmm. and they now have the, the authority to administer truth that is part of God's truth. And we've shifted the authority from the Word of God to others. Yeah. Let me close with this this scripture in Jeremiah. 
chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. It said, has a nation changed its gods which are not gods? Again, Christianized humanism can be a form of idolatry, mm -hmm. can be a form of sorcery, depending on the methodologies and the techniques. Mm -hmm. And it says, but my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. We talked about fear of the Lord. It's not in the mm -hmm. land anymore. Mm -hmm. Be very desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. Mm. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns.